Well, Jim, thank you for being here. You've written this terrific book, Enhanced Interrogation, Inside the Mind and Motive of Islamic Terrorists Trying to Destroy America. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks for having me on. So, um, just so, what I found most fascinating about the book is that you recount for the first time your conversations with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, and many of the other terrorists. Um, and this, no one's heard from KSM uh, since 9-11. He's never been interviewed. He's never done a, all people know is that picture of him uh, disheveled on the day he was, uh, he was captured. What, what is KSM like? Well, it depends on what stage of my acquaintance with him, <laughs> frankly. In the beginning, he was like the devil. I mean, he was uh, belligerent, he was hostile, he was angry. Um, then, uh, after EITs and we drifted into uh, debriefings, uh, he became charming and, and more cordial. You know, evil doesn't always look evil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's most powerful when it can get inside of your defenses. And KSM is one of those guys, when he turns on the charm, that's extremely good at it. Can you explain the difference, just so people understand that these things you're going to be sharing with us are, were not happening while TSM was strapped down to a waterboard? Can you explain the difference between EITs and debriefing and also what you called, uh, you know, fireside chats? Sure. Uh, interrogation for the CIA was when you're questioning somebody who's actively resisting trying to provide you the information. Mm -hmm. They're trying to hide their secrets and uh, wouldn't engage in, in, with the question. and so. In those particular cases, the, EI, the uh, enhanced interrogation techniques would be used normally only for a couple of weeks. You know, uh, usually within about 72 hours, people were beginning to try to find ways to cooperate. When they started trying to find ways to cooperate, we moved as quickly as we could into debriefing. And debriefing is a conversation like you and I are having right here. So you uh, talk to KSM just the way we're talking right now. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and actually. Um, longer and in much more depth than we're probably going to discuss. Yeah. So there were also uh, other uh, times that we had conversations where um, we had this thing we called a fireside chat, which is basically after the interrogation was over, we would come back in and we would say, how was that for you? Let's talk about uh, how you did. Let's talk about some of your answers. You know, and, and sometimes they would reveal information they hadn't revealed. It was a continuation of the debriefing uh, or the interrogation, but um, uh, it wasn't uh, officially part of the debriefing because what we wanted to do was dislocate their expectations. We wanted them to think it was over, and now we were just in checking to see how it went. And then there were several other different kinds of conversations we had. You said that technique came from the OSS. It did come from the OSS. Um, the OSS used to have a selection process for selecting people they were going to drop behind enemy lines. And part of the selection process was to tell the person, never reveal your true name until I give you these code words. Mm -hmm. right? And then what would happen is they would put them in a very difficult course where they were guaranteed to fail. And someone would come along, same person, and pretend that they were full and pulling them from the course because they were an abject failure. And then that person would start outbriefing them and ask them for his name as part of the outbriefing. And if the person gave his name, they would throw him out of the program because he didn't wait for the signal. And the real test was when he was supposed to give his, you know, when he was supposed to hear the signal. And what that told us was that sometimes the situation pulls for behaviors. And so for us to say to, to a man like KSM, well, the interrogation's over and we're just back in here to chat with you a little bit about how that went. You know, how was that for you? What was that? This is what it was like for me. You seemed uh, to be hiding something when uh, we were talking about this particular thing. I wonder if you noticed that. So it felt like less like an interrogation. It felt more like um, a chat, you mm. know, a chat. We also had, he also gave classes that were not part of the debriefing or the interrogation on things of... Well, describe that, because he said he, he, ran a terrorist he ran a terrorist training camp for the CIA when we were in a classroom with all of you where he would have a, have right. a whiteboard. He, he, had a, he had a whiteboard. He had an, uh, a dry erase board. And he would uh, pick out a topic like uh, how we finance or how we move money or how we do, he called it sticks of fear, but reconnaissance of a target or... Um, just any of any topic really he'd pick it out and, and we'd go and set and he would get up at the chalk at the chalkboard and he would you know write his lesson plan and he would question us and 
and he would tease us afterwards and say, well, now you are, should be on the FBI's most wanted list because you've been trained by KSM at the terrorist training camp, you know, that sort of stuff. It was amusing. And, and there were also these other visits that I describe in the book that are, uh, they call them maintenance visits, but really they were morale visits because we were concerned that um, we didn't want them to spend a lot of time in isolation because isolation they get depressed and they don't want to talk. And so we would stop by for just a how's it going meeting, you know, and uh, some of them would want to play basketball because we had a basketball court. Some of them would want to lift weights. Some of them would want to practice karate. Some of them would, uh, you know, want to uh, discuss a book or play chess. KSM liked to pontificate. And mm -hmm. so we would sit and talk to him. And most of the things I have to say about the mindset either came from his lectures or his, uh, uh, when we stopped by for these maintenance visits, because he could talk about anything he and wanted. And you say to. he was charming. Very charming. Tell us about that. I mean, what were they, what, what? Well, uh, when you, he smiled a lot, he asked you questions. Uh, if, you, if he knew you when you walked into the room, so he'd be sitting in a chair, right, hooded. And when you walked in the room and took the hood off, he'd reach and hold your hand while he was talking to you. It was just, I don't know how to describe it except to say he was charming. You know, it was like, it was like Yoda. It was like talking to Yoda, uh, uh, except that Yoda, you know, could sometimes be the devil. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the moments when he was the devil is when uh, there was a debriefing uh, where uh, I think it was about WMD and he turned to you and he said, bring the lady back who takes the notes. I want to tell you something important. Yeah, Dr. Justin and I were uh, in there with a WMD expert who was questioning him about whether or not uh, Al-Qaeda had uh, nuclear material. And uh, after that was over, because it was somewhat contentious, um, it was a debriefing, but it was a little bit contentious. Uh, Bruce, Dr. Jessen said, I think it was Dr. Jessen, said to KSM, this is our fireside chat. He mm -hmm. said to KSM, um, you know, I noticed at times that it looked like you wanted to say something, like you had more to say, but then you, then you backed away from it. And uh, KSM said, looked at me, you know, like, like I was his errand boy. He looked at me and he said, go get that lady who takes the notes. Uh, even though she was the WMD expert and a phenomenal uh, analyst, remember he's a terrorist who uh, basically didn't like women and mm -hmm. didn't really like talking to them. And so he said, go get that lady who, who takes the notes. And then when she came back with me, uh, he described beheading uh, and dismembering Daniel Pearl. What was that like to sit through there and listen to? Because it must have been, as he described this to you, you must have had a sense of revulsion, but you couldn't really express that. Well, I did tear up. I mean, of course, I tear up a lot. I'd cry at dog food commercials. But he, uh, he, he you know, he talked about cutting his throat and, and dismembering him. and. One of us, I can't remember which one of it was, said, was that difficult for you? Because we found it, you know, you know just reprehensible. Uh, and he said, oh, no. Oh, no, I had lots of sharp knives, and I had to keep sharpening them. And the only difficult thing was cutting through the neck bone. Just, just that casually, you know. Um, and then he went on, you know, he went on to, de to uh, describe, like I said, how he dismembered him and buried him in a hole because the ground was too frozen. And... It was horrible. And uh, you said that he continued to refer to him as, as Daniel. He called him Daniel. And just in this weird sort of intimate, like they were friends, you know. I think Daniel, you know, it just creeped me out. Uh, it did. And on the way back to this, you know, it, after it's over, on the way back to the cell, uh, one of the guards who, who was, you know, with me, was escorting him and with me, turned to me and said, that guy needs to die. Not because he thought that we should do anything, we should do anything to him, but just that the world would be safer if monsters like that weren't around. Um, later on, of course, you know, when, when we sent the information back to CIA headquarters that he had claimed that he had killed Daniel Pearl, there were some people who were skeptical. So uh, I, as I explained in the book, we, we we recreated the the video so they could compare the anatomical features of his arm and the patterns of his in his skin 
to what they could see on the video and confirm that indeed it was him who cut off Daniel Paul's head. And what did he say when you, when you told him he had oh, confirmed it? He said, yes, I cut his head off with these blessed hands. That's what he said. And he was mugging for the camera. And, he, and if, he, if he thought the camera wasn't positioned just right, he would move people around. And they had a sack uh, filled with flour or something. And, and uh, he had all these you know, kind of particular things he wanted done with it so that it was more realistic. Despicable. So it's uh, so you're sitting here and you're having to you're engaging him and you have to develop a friendly relationship with him because you're trying to get him to be cooperative, uh, but ever and he's charming as you say, but then the evil pops out uh, on occasion. Are there other occasions when you really saw the evil behind his, behind his uh, facade? Well, we saw I saw it pretty easily when we did the neutral assessment. You know, uh, when before you do any of these enhanced interrogations, you you give the person a chance. I mean, you sit down with the person, well, actually we stand. You stand there with the person and you say, this, this is the kind of information that we want. And uh, he was hostile and belligerent. And uh, uh, when, we were, when I was asking him about catastrophic attacks in the United States, he said, soon you will know, you know, soon you will know. And it was disdainful, but all that went away after the EITs. Yeah, and so he became cooperative, um, and you you write about how he. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people now in the United States who say that uh, the reason they attacked us on September 11, 2001, is because they wanted to draw us into Afghanistan. They wanted to trap us in a quagmire over there and weigh us down like they had, and, and uh, like the Soviet Union, and that ISIS is trying to do the same thing now in Iraq and Syria. But when you talk to KSM about what he expected us to do after 9-11, it was a very different story. What did, what did he tell you what he expected us, the response to 9-11 to be? Okay. Um, he he um, said that uh, when the planes hit the tower that they didn't expect the World Trade Center to collapse. I mean, they did expect that the airplane would hit the Pentagon, that the airplane would hit the Capitol, which it didn't do because of the brave men and women on Flight 90, United Flight 93. And uh, he, they thought that they would a couple of floors would be damaged and some you know a lot of people would be killed, but that the towers wouldn't collapse. And then when the towers collapsed, he said he thought it was a sign from Allah that their cause was just and that Allah was behind them, and that this was a, a beacon that would draw like-minded jihadists to rise up around the world and pursue their goal, their Islamist goal of of. Uh, uh, imposing Sharia law on the whole world, and it would start with the United States. He said, but then, all of a sudden, we're lucky to survive the night. He said that the uh, swiftness and the ferocity of President Bush's response kept them off balance. You know, they were just running and hiding and, you know, try, trying not to end up dead. The second in command, Abu Hafsa Masri, was killed in a, in a missile attack. And, uh, uh, they were just on the run, just trying to not get killed. They quit using electronics. They couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't reach out. What most people probably don't know is that there was a group called uh, that was run by a man named Hambali who had done the uh, what we call the Bali bombing, uh, and he had a, a young group of folks just like the pilots in 9/11, who he had. I think he was going to Australia, and they were going to train to fly planes into buildings or just enough to be able to fly this is the Garaba cell. Yes. Yes. And um, what uh, happened was the ferocity of George Bush's response kept them off so much off balance that they weren't able to pursue that plot. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it delayed it and, dis, and uh, disrupted it in such a way that they had difficulty getting it off. And then because of the EITs, we were able to capture different Al Qaeda operatives, and so and so their leadership started falling like dominoes, and then the plot was completely disrupted. And he said he told you that he expected us to respond like uh, the Reagan administration had to the Beirut bombing. Right. What he said was, we thought that you were going to respond like it was a law enforcement thing. We didn't expect that World Trade Center to collapse, and we thought you were going to respond like a law enforcement. We thought that what would happen is. Uh, you would turn it over to the FBI. They would do this year-long, month, two-year-long investigation. They would maybe be able to find out an individual's name because they didn't expect that the whole group would be held accountable. They thought we were going to do like we do with criminals. We were going to try to find the individual people who had done it, mm -hmm. and most of them were dead, and that just left 
him and Ramsey Beneshiba and you know some of his cohorts like uh, Amara Bellucci. And so we thought we would try to hunt those particular people down. And they had worked out a deal with the Taliban where they had killed the leader of the Northern Alliance with the assurances that if they helped them kill the leader of the Northern Alliance, the Taliban would resist having uh, turning them over to the U.S. when they eventually found out who did it. But, but what happened was, well, in fact, he explained that to me. And then he looks down and he looks up and goes, how was I supposed to know that cowboy George Bush would tell the world he wanted us dead or alive and then invade Afghanistan to get us? And like, like Bush wasn't playing fair, you know, <laughs> like, like he had somehow broke the rules. And uh, he was just stunned by the ferocity of it. So the lesson, I mean, so the lesson going forward as we're dealing with ISIS and we're dealing still with Al-Qaeda because there's Al-Qaeda in Syria and they've, they've got cells all over the world is they're not trying to draw us in. They well, don't they want mean, us to come in and go after them. They want, they, they, their goal is to make us retreat and withdraw, isn't it? I, well, what they believe they can do is enough damage that the Americans will grow tired of it. Mm -hmm. uh, KSM said that the real battlefield is not out there. It's inside the mind of Americans mm -hmm. because they know that the American people can shut down any effort that the government has. If they, and so what he thinks will happen is the American people will grow tired of it and the American people just won't want it to continue, that, they'll, that the, that the uh, attacks and the deaths and all that stuff will, will just make us want to stop and that we will accept the imposition of Sharia law um, just to make it go away. So uh, in terms of, of drawing us in, he, his plan wasn't to draw us in. He didn't want that to happen. His plan was to launch another attack in the United States. He already had people on the ground over here. He already had a uh, series of what I would call harassing attacks, mm -hmm. you know, which was basically once you got the FBI involved in his mind, uh, they have a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of people. And if he could do a series of smaller, horrific attacks inside the United States, that would help deplete the resources and give them some more time to get this other attack off the ground. So the idea was he was expecting law enforcement response just like they had after the coal bombing, just like we had after yeah, the- Yeah, he said, he said, what he said was, I expected the, the, the president to do what all the other presidents had done. In 1983, after they killed 200 plus uh, Marines in Lebanon, uh, Reagan turned tail and run. Uh, we bombed two embassies in 1998. Clinton did nothing but fire a couple of missiles at a at a, uh, a, a an abandoned training camp. Uh, and when we did the coal in uh, uh, 2000 in in Yemen, there was really no response. And so he thought, based on what he had experienced, he thought that President Bush was going to respond the same way. And President Bush didn't. And what I would say to people who are listening to me talk is, think about the way we've handled this for the last eight years and ask yourself, what are they thinking now? Mm -hmm. so we're, we're back to the old way of withdrawing in, in the face of, uh, of, of danger. But so the idea was they, were, they, they had the Taliban prepared to resist extradition. Address, uh, uh, he was going to have time to plan the second wave of attacks. Well, they already had it planned. Mm -hmm. They already had it in motion. Yeah. You know, it was coming together. But once the attack occurred, the peop they couldn't communicate, they couldn't move freely, mm -hmm. they couldn't use electronics, and so it... it uh, and so what did he have planned? Because he said there were going to be there were going to be harassing attacks. He, was he had a plot oh, to blow up gas stations. Oh, you're asking me about the biggest plot. Yeah. Well, about the gas... Well, well, there were going to be the harassing attacks to distract us while, they're, while they planned for the big follow-on attack. So right? you're asking about the harassing attacks. Yeah. Well, they had uh, people inside of the ground. One of the things that he said that he wanted to do uh, based on the Malvo thing, the Beltway shooter. He talked about that, right? Yeah, he, he was fascinated by it. You know, it, 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 uh, he said it taught him a lesson about economy of scale, that you didn't need those uh, large catastrophic attacks. They would be nice, and you would pursue them, but if you had one or two brothers who were willing to do low-tech uh, attacks, and you had lots of those doing them, then uh, you could... Uh, the specific thing he said is... Uh, just like infected fleas can bring down an elephant, little bite here, little bite there, the elephant gets sick and dies. Mm -hmm. He said, that's how we could cripple America. Mm -hmm. And so what he, one of the things he wanted was, uh, he wanted to blow up gas stations all along the East Coast. 
and and uh, he was working on before he was captured uh, a explosive device that he could s send down that pipe mm -hmm. that tanker trucks used to fill those you know those gas tanks mm -hmm. and uh, he told us he had bought a gas station in Pakistan and was practicing uh, and trying he had to, actually bought a gas station that's in what Pakistan. he said I don't know if it's true or not but that's what he said and uh, was actually trying to develop the technology to be able to disperse the the explosive that was inside of the device such that he got the largest fireball possible and could create as much chaos and kill as many people as he could. He wasn't mm -hmm. interested in a small cell one. But he thought if you did that randomly or simultaneously all up and down the East Coast, then it would uh, essentially cripple us mm -hmm. right, for a time being, just like the Beltway, the Beltway shooter did. Mm -hmm. And he actually had a guy in the United States that the, the FBI um, um, uh, caught, mm -hmm. you know, in part um, the information from the CIA informed them about this guy, uh, but he actually had a gas route, and he was actually driving a gas tanker, and he was delivering gas, mm -hmm. and he was just waiting for them to perfect that uh, device so that he could place them in the gas stations, and that plot was disrupted. There was another plot he had that was kind of a harassing plot where what he wanted to do was he wanted to uh, uh, bring down a major bridge like the Washington Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, and he had a guy working on uh, acquiring the uh, shape charges that would be necessary to cut the cables. Now, I spent the first six years of my adult life at, as, on the bomb squad as a bomb guy, and we had shape charges that cut an engine in half. And so I know people don't think you can cut those big cables, but they build a shape charge specifically to cut those big cables, and this guy was trying to acquire that shape charge. And he wasn't successful, but he was still working on it. And what he was trying to do was to keep us busy until the student pilots that he, that he had Himbali training could launch that attack. And they, had a, they intended to do another a major catastrophic attack uh, hitting a hitting building in Los Angeles, the library building, I think it's called. It's uh, now the U.S. Bank Tower, but it was the library tower at the yeah, time. Library yeah, library tower. Uh, one in Seattle, and then uh, the Sears Tower in Chicago. Those were the three targets. He intended to hit all of those targets with planes. And how did talk, talk about how we broke the, broke up the uh, the Garaba cell? Because we he helped uh, the detainees helped lead us to Hambali, who was the right. mastermind behind that attack, right? Right. We, they were. Um, you know, I, as I said, they fell like dominoes, and, mm -hmm. and each little piece of information that we got allowed us to catch another person, which got us closer to the next person. So it wasn't that a single person said, "This is how you go catch in Bali." Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's that the uh, the brilliant men and women at the CIA who are the targeters and the analysts put the little pieces of information we got from these guys together into a larger matrix that allowed it to them to identify. You know, we identified the courier who gave him the money, who passed the money between them, we, you know, that sort of stuff. That's Majid Khan, yes. Yeah. So, um, and tell us a little bit about Jose Padilla. So Jose Padilla is dismissed by most people as he was the, he was the, uh, the uh, dirty bomber. He was going to have this fantastical attack yeah. uh, that he had planned uh, to, uh, to release a dirty bomb in the United States. And everybody sort of dismisses that as kind of fa uh, fantastical. But he, uh, he actually was coming here when he was captured on a very uh, serious and realistic plot. Uh, by KSM. Yeah, he, he was, uh, he was, Abu Zubeda, who said he never harbored any ill feelings towards the United States, uh, was living with uh, Jose Padilla. He called mm -hmm. him Abu Ameriki. Uh, and Jose Padilla uh, was, Abu Zubeda said, crazy for doing nuclear attack in the United States. He said, but he didn't think it was practical. He didn't think this guy was smart enough to do it. Right? Mm -hmm. He said, but, He's going to do something that that uh, uh, alerts the you know Pakistanis that we're here. So we got to get him out of our thing. And he knew that KSM already had people on the ground, and he knew that KSM liked people with U.S. passports so that he could use him. And KSM would have some kind of a plan for him to be used. And so what happened was he sent him to KSM, and KSM thought he would use him for Chechnyan-style apartment bombings. And so, uh, and what are those? Explain that. Well, they, you rent an apartment in a high-rise in, in. Well, I was just say they're going to do it in Chicago. 
rent an apartment in a high rise. You seal the seams in the windows and doors so that no gas can get out. You either turn on the stove that if it's gas or you bring in propane in some way. And then you leave a remote detonating device in the thing, uh, in the house. And then at some point during rush hour, you blow up the building. And if you're lucky, the entire floor collapses and debris falls down and, and kills a bunch of people. And when Jose Padilla was captured, he was flying in, I think it was into Chicago with $5,000 and instructions from uh, KSM to do these Chechen style apartment bombings. And so uh, another plot that, uh, so some of the, as, as you, the interrogation program became, there were leaks and became more public, one, you know, there were some of the plots that you, that KSM described to you uh, started coming out. And one of those was uh, a plot to, uh, to poison reservoirs. And uh, people again, poo-pooed it and said that it would, you know, the, how much chemical it would take to poison a reservoir. And so you actually came to KSM and said, people yeah, are doubting you. It was one <laughs> of those, it wasn't a, you know, we weren't, I wasn't trying to get intel from him at that point because this didn't happen during an interrogation or a mm -hmm. debriefing. It was, I was there for a how's it going kind mm -hmm. of meeting with him. Sure. And I said, you know, Mook, I called him Mook because he, he liked to be called Mukhtar and he- What does Mukhtar mean? The brain, you know. So I just called him the Mook because like I said, he was a lot like Yoda. He'd lost all that weight and you know, he had a big beard. And um, so I said, People in the United States, they hear this thing about poisoning reservoirs. They say it takes a lot of poison. They just don't think it's practical. He goes, he looked at me like I had two heads. I mean, he looked at me like I, I had said the dumbest thing on the planet. And he said, well, of course you wouldn't do that. He said, I have a degree in engineering from a university in North Carolina. And I was the uh, chief engineer at a water treatment plant in Qatar. You know, I know how to poison this thing and it wouldn't be that way and he said and I don't need to kill people I just need to make them sick because the I, we're gonna win by frightening people by terrorizing people it's nice if we can kill them but the real target is the American mind so he had a lot of ideas for plots uh, that he described to Endless. you um, and uh, you know the, as ingenious as that as ingenious as 9-11 um, and he told you what they were. I mean, without revealing anything that could uh, pass information on to, uh, to terrorists who might carry those out, uh, can you describe a little bit about, about his thinking, his, uh, the sort of the mind behind that, and also how dangerous would it be if this guy was able to communicate with the outside world? I don't think he should have free communication with the outside world, although if they monitor it and they track the other end, let him make all the phone calls he wants to make. <laughs> Right, but uh, in terms of in terms of uh, the plots, his he, he, uh, he talked to me about economy of scale. He said that Al Qaeda dreamed of having these large catastrophic attacks, and don't get me wrong, he's behind them. He mm -hmm. likes that idea because it frightens more Americans. He said, but the real way to do it is with lots of low-level attacks, lots of low-technology attacks, randomly done throughout the United States. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to talk about what those attacks were, no, but they no. seemed, you know. Plausible. Yeah. So um, we've heard from Senator Feinstein and Senator McCain and others that detainees had nothing to do with the, uh, with the uh, information that led us to Osama bin Laden. R are they right? No. They're not right. The CIA, it doesn't matter what Jim thinks, it matters what the CIA thinks. And in their pushback and in the uh, response of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Minority Report, um, they debunked that notion really well. I mean, the, the uh, onus behind this notion that, it, that didn't, what, didn't get any useful information is this idea that KSM lied to us. Mm -hmm. Well. Sometimes when you're an interrogator or a skillful analyst, the lie tells you more than the truth. And what happened is once Amar Bellucci was captured. He was KSM's nephew. KSM's right? nephew and, and another member of the 9-11 crew who was mm -hmm. planning another catastrophic attack in Pakistan uh, when he was captured. He, uh, when he was captured after EITs, he told um, the people who were questioning him that um, Abu Ahmed Al Kuwaiti, yeah. Al -Kuwaiti mm -hmm. had delivered a letter from UBL 
to Abu Faraj, appointing Abu Faraj the Emir of External Operations. So KSM's successor. K he's KSM's successor. And basically there was an Emir for operations inside the uh, Arabian Peninsula and then Emir, an Emir for External Operations. And by operations, we mean terror attacks. Yeah. Right? That's what they're mm -hmm. talking about. Sure. They're talking about terror attacks. And so, you know, uh, Abulucci is KSM's nephew, so we go to KSM and say, what's this about? And they say, oh, and he says, oh, no, no, no. That guy retired. I, I never told him that, you know. This, I, there was a guy named uh, Abu Ahmed uh, al Kuwaiti, but he's gone. He quit in 2000, I, I, you know. I don't know what he's saying. So we go back to the first guy and we say, he says, you don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, that guy's lying, you know, because he did tell me that, right? And that piece of information was, and the importance of the courier was highlighted by the fact that the detainees thought they had a secret way of communicating, but it wasn't. We, <laughs> we knew about it. Uh -huh. and, uh, and you let them keep it. And let them keep it so that we could see what they were saying to each other, mm -hmm. right? With the, with the full knowledge that if it got too weird, we'd have to intervene. But, you know, we wanted to be able to monitor what they were saying. And, and he sent out a message on that secret communication thing that said, don't talk about the courier. Whatever you do, don't tell them about Abu Ahmed, right? And he might as well send up a flare. Uh, in addition to that, they had uh, Abu Faraj at, at a later point, Abu Faraj, who had gotten the letter, said, I never heard of the guy. The guy doesn't exist. And yet there were, when you question the other detainees who were not as close to that, they said, oh, yeah, you know, um, uh, 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 Abu, uh, Abu Ahmed, uh, you know, does a lot of stuff for bin Laden. You know, he, he you know, he, he, uh, he, he couriers out to meet we with leaders. Because in 2002, bin Laden went to ground. He quit using electronics. He, ha he, never, he seldom went outside. He seldom moved. Um, he had a small guard force, and he had a handful of people who were helping him. And um, Abu Ahmed was one of those people. And uh, so we had other detainees who said, well, you know, one of bin Laden's wives gave a letter to Abu Faraj to get to UBL. Well, like most people, you wouldn't give a letter to a total stranger and ask him to get get it to your wife or your husband if you didn't think that person had some way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, so you knew he was lying. Yeah, you knew he was lying. Well, all the other detainees except for those, not all of them, but a significant number of the other detainees except for those two, you know, acknowledged that there was a person named, you know, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti and the, and the rumor was among the brothers that he was the courier. And so we're, we're told that uh, it really, um, you know, that uh, it wasn't uh, interrogations, it was signals intelligence that played a key role. But it was what's up, what a detainee told you that enabled the signals intelligence. Can you right. explain what, that story? Yeah. Um, after enhanced interrogations, uh, Abu Yasser al Jazeera uh, said that he, that he knew this uh, Abu Ahmed and that Abu Ahmed had a speech impediment. And because of the speech impediment, he spoke in Arabic and Pashtun and just mixed it all up. Mm -hmm. Right, he just mixed it up, and if so he had a unique way of speaking. He had a very unique way of speaking, which allowed our signalless intelligence to track, however they do that, to, <laughs> to the place where this guy was living. You know, and uh, the the thought was, given how close UBL has been keeping the people around him, that he might be living in the same house with UBL, and then after that, the whole story's out. So there. that was a criti critical piece of intelligence that enabled well, well, it's, other it's, tools of intelligence. Uh, you know, my understanding is it's what actually informed them of what to look for in the signals intelligence. And so you hear from people like Senator McCain who say, well, you know, we got the name, the, the true name, not the jihadi name, but the true name of, uh, of Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti long before the CIA program from another detainee who was not in CIA custody, was in the custody of a foreign country. And so therefore, th this, all this stuff really didn't, is not what led to him. Well, they say that, but if it's the if it's the reference, if you're referencing what I'm thinking, you're referencing the guy said there was this guy and now he's dead, right? So you wouldn't immediately jump from that to mm -hmm. uh, to thinking that it's and it was a long point. list of people, right? Right. It's, the way they worked with those folks is when they capture someone, they'll say, "Tell us everyone that has any contact with UBL," and he was just a one name in a in a long list of names, right? So it'd be like. You get a phone book, 
uh, group of people. Well, you don't know who is important in that list. You have to have something that comes from uh, the interrogations or the debriefings that highlight who that person is that's important. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Islam and the role it, it plays in this. So you hear from a lot of people that uh, who are trying to separate Islamic radicalism from the broader Islam, that this, is, this has nothing to do with Islam, uh, what, they, what they're doing. And KSM told you differently. Yeah, basically, uh, it doesn't matter what the victims think. I could think all day long that it has nothing to do with Islam. It matters what the attackers think. Mm -hmm. And if I want to stop the attackers, I have to be willing to acknowledge that they think it's all about a particular form of Islam. Is Islamism is what I call it, which is where they want to replace, uh, they want to put install sh uh, Sharia law throughout the world. And so, um, uh, so I'll give you an example. There were probably people in the World Trade Center who thought that the attack on the USS Cole had nothing to do with Islam that it was some kind of a power grab or some sort of regional dispute or, you know, it's a rogue band of people who are acting out, but not, not Islam. But the guy flying the plane that hit that building, it was all about Islam. And it was all about a particular kind of Islam. They were trying, they are trying to breathe new life into a uh, Iron Age religion that has been dormant for centuries. They're trying to get folks to rise up and conquer the world and impose Sharia law following the same um, rules of war that, uh, that, uh, it, that are espoused in the Quran and that uh, um, in the perfect words and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. So KSM told you uh, that Islam is a religion of peace, but he had a very different definition of peace. Well, we were talking about the meaning of words. You know, I was saying, well, well how is it possible uh, that all of these attacks occur when people tell me all the time, and I actually read in some of the ancient texts, that Islam is a religion of peace. How, how is that possible? And he said, well, you, you're using peace differently than we use peace. The world will be at peace when the entire world is under Sharia law. And so Islam is a religion of peace because we strive through violence to make peace. Mm -hmm. you know. And they also uh, have a different definition of freedom. Well, that was actually, I don't know that they all do, but in terms of Abu Zubaydah, I asked Abu Zubaydah, because he had a pretty wild life before he became a jihadist. I asked Abu Zubaydah, it seems to me like everything you do, how can, this, how can you be free? Because he was talking about individual freedom and how being a, an Islamist, a Salafist, um, was the ultimate in individual freedom. And I said, well, everything you do is dictated. It's all dictated by some guy that was around 1,400 years ago. He said, that's it, it's free. Every decision that I need to make has already been made. So I am free. I am free of decisions. Hmm. I am free of choices. KSM told you that our civil liberties are flaws that Allah put into our system that they exploit in order to, uh, in order to attack us. Right. He said that Americans lack the, you know, that we're strong militarily, but that we're weak in moral fortitude. That uh, our civil liberties and our openness and our tolerance and the fact that we want the whole world to like us is a flaw that Allah put in our character to make it possible for them uh, to conquer us. And uh, I haven't talked to him about it, but I, my guess would be this obsessive political correctness is another one of those things that he would say is a flaw. You, you know, what he would say essentially is that obsessive political correctness allows them to operate in our midst without being challenged. It allows them to ratchet up Sharia law without challenging them. So we've had a debate in this country uh, during the presidential campaign about immigration, specifically Muslim immigration. Uh, uh, Donald Trump has raised a lot of concerns about it. He's raised concerns about Syrian refugees coming into this country. Um, and we know, of course, that the vast majority of those refugees are actually victims of Islamic radicalism. The, Muslim, the, Islamist, the Islamists, as opposed to the Muslims, uh, the Islamists target them more than anyone else. Uh, but the fear is that they will use refugee flows or immigration flows as a uh, Trojan horse to sneak operatives into our country to hide among us and, and use our freedoms as a, as a shield. Uh, KSM talked a little bit about that. Can you tell us what he said? Yeah, he, 
you know, what he uh, would fre frequently do is start the conversation by saying, uh, Al Qaeda leadership wants huge catastrophic attacks, but that's really not the way that the U.S. is going to be defeated. The U.S. essentially is going to collapse because like-minded brothers, meaning uh, people who wanted to impose Sharia law, would uh, Islamists would immigrate to the United States, wrap themselves in our civil liberties for protection, and uh, uh, support themselves with our welfare system while they spread their jihadi message. And then when they were strong enough, rise up and impose Sharia law from within. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that he had was that immigration would allow them to slowly ratchet up the acceptance of Sharia law. And what I would say about that is political correctness, where we're not even willing to acknowledge that if we bring in unvetted, I'm not, you know, anybody who's an immigrant and wants to legally immigrate to the United States and wants to become American, I say let them in, you know, let them legally immigrate, let them do whatever, if they, as long as they want to become American. But if they want to bring these Iron Age philosophies, and I'm not talking about Islam in general, I'm talking about Islamists, right? Because yeah. if you're just, you know, if you, ordinary Muslims I have no complaint with. But Islamists, if you're one of those people who think that uh, Sharia law should be imposed in the United States or all over the world, I'd just soon you stayed home and fixed your own but don't bring that crap over here and mess our country up the way you've messed yours up. So what he, he said what happened is they would wrap themselves in our civil liberties, they would support themselves with our welfare systems, and then when the time was right, they would rise up and attack and impose Sharia law from within. And we've already seen some of that uh, in, in our country. We've seen uh, people who are either refugees or Muslim immigrants who have uh, who've yeah. carried out attacks. Yeah, I don't believe, I don't, I can't speak for him because I haven't seen him since he went sure. to, to uh, Guantanamo Bay, but he wouldn't be surprised that like-minded brothers immigrated to the United States, even if they weren't sent by ISIS or by uh, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. because we're vulnerable. You know, we have political correctness that allow them to come into the country and operate in our midst without being challenged. What did he tell you about deception? Well, he said that he, he said that uh, uh, deception in Islam is expected. You know that basically, let's see if I can remember the order of them. There's jihad by the sword, and you can use deception to, much as we have done in our military, to feign and and, and to lure your uh, enemies into traps. And then there's jihad by the hand, and in jihad by the hand, what you could do is. Um, if you couldn't fight, then you were expected to use your money and to use your organizations and that sort of stuff. So you could set up an organization that in theory uh, uh, collected money for charities and did that. It was necessary that you actually do that, but part of that money went off to the side. Maybe even the bulk of that money went off to the side to support jihad. You know? And then there was uh, uh, de deception of the, uh, I think it was of the tongue. Where jihad of the tongue, yeah. Uh -huh. Jihad of the tongue? Yeah. So, yes, and the deception there was that you basically said things that sounded like um, you were agreeing with the infidel, like Islam is a religion of peace, when you know in your mind and in your heart that the only way there's going to be peace is if Sharia law is in the whole world, or Islam doesn't want to kill innocents, or, and then in your head you know that to be innocent, you first have to be a Muslim, right? And then you have to be killed within a certain range of time before you get to make a choice about it. Mm -hmm. So these folks go back to that, uh, uh, these dormant traditions and mm -hmm. try to breathe new life. And he told you that actually that he saw Muslims condemning the 9-11 attacks and he understood why they were doing it. Well, he understood why they were doing it and he, and he, and he said he, thought, he saw them rejoicing in their eyes and in their heart. Um, that's what he said. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, t the terrorist think tank. So you just you say well, after this program had gotten to a certain point where you had enough of these guys and they had moved from a state of resistance to a state of cooperation or cooperating, you basically set up a terrorist. Uh, you know, what in the, in the business community would be called like uh, you know the uh, they were a, uh, a working group that was helping you. Uh, you know, well, game things out. Not me specifically, but the CIA. The CIA. Yeah, I meant you collectively. Yeah, collectively. Yeah, collectively. Yes. Well. After, long after the EITs, when we had that large group of senior level uh, 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 terrorists that we were holding, 
you could take a a uh, piece of technical collection or you could take a letter that you had intercepted or you could take a photograph or you could take the pocket litter uh, of someone that you had just captured and you could go from cell to cell comparing what they say without telling them what the other person said. Mm -hmm. So you might take a picture to a person like Abu Zubaydah and Abu Zubaydah would say, I know this guy. And he would tell you about the guy that you're asking about, right? He does this, he does that, he trained this, I trained him, I, I gave him these kind of passports, this is what I did. You take that same picture to KSM and ask him about that guy. KSM will tell you about that guy, but he'll also say, I know that guy in the background. That guy that's sitting at that other table or sitting in, you know, in that other area, that guy's a sniper and we've been training him to do this and this is where, you know, this. Uh, and, we, and then we were able to go back to Zabeda and say, what do you know about this guy? And we were able to bounce back and forth across all of these, uh, well, no, I won't say all, but a large number of these uh, senior level terrorists that were being held, the high value detainees, and compare, they would help us interpret letters, they would help us uh, interpret uh, tech, technical uh, uh, intelligence, they would help us interpret uh, um, photographs, you know, and they would provide us with tremendous amounts of information. And there was a synergy there because we could so quickly move from cell to cell, we didn't have to wait weeks and it didn't have to go into cable traffic and it didn't have to bounce around the world. The same uh, brilliant analyst who uh, generated the uh, intelligence requirements could go to their cells and talk to them individually without uh, telling them what they already knew and then collectively piece that back together. When we lost that, I think um, it was a major blow. And that was in 2006 when we sent these guys to Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. Have we gotten any any intelligence from them since they moved to Guantanamo not Bay? Not one single intel report that I've, I mean, I, I was, I'm not working with the agency now, but I was for a couple of years after that happened. And, to my knowledge, we haven't gotten anything out of it. They pretty much stopped talking. Um, and you, would you present them with scenarios? Like, is, is, you know, what would you do in this situation or what would you do in that situation? Uh, you started oh, using yeah. them as a, like Al-Qaeda management consultants almost. Yeah, so you know? one of the things we did with Abu Zubaydah, and it was so incredibly useful, uh, was we were asking him how to find Hassan Ghul. Mm -hmm. Because Hassan Gould is an important facilitator and uh, worked with KSM and uh, did a lot of things for him. And we wanted to find Hassan Gould. And we kept saying, because the intelligent requirement was, you know, uh, ask him where Hassan Gould is. Right? Mm -hmm. So we'd say, where's Hassan Gould? And he'd say, I don't know. And uh, headquarters would say, it's inconceivable that he doesn't know where Hassan Gould is. You know, maybe we need to go back to EITs. And, and we'd say, oh, he's working with us. Let's figure out what's going on. And so. I can't remember whether it was me or Dr. Jessen, uh, but one of us thought to ask him, well, suppose we let you go. Suppose we just walked you to the door and let you go. How would you go about finding Hassan Ghul? And, and Abu Zubaydah said, well, that's a different question. I would go to, you know, the city in Pakistan. I'd find this specific man. I would ask this man well, where, where Hassan Ghul is because this man always provides apartments for Hassan Ghul. And that's what they did. They went to Pakistan, they interviewed this man. He said, oh yeah, I supplied the apartment for Hassan Ghul. And they go to raid Hassan Ghul's apartment, but they don't catch Hassan Ghul, they catch Ben Ashiba, mm -hmm. right? Now, Feinstein and the crew would give them no credit for catching Ben Ashiba, right? But they wouldn't have caught Ben Ashiba if Abu Zubaydah hadn't talked about how he would find Hassan Ghul. Mm -hmm. Ben Ashiba was hiding out in Hassan Ghul's apartment. So now, one, one story you told me which was fascinating was about how at one point there was a detainee who was telling, uh, saying that KSM set him off on a particular plot and KSM kept insisting he didn't know about it. And the agency was actually talking about going back to the he EITs. He said he couldn't remember it. Yeah, and he, they, they were actually thinking about going back to EITs and you were trying to figure out, you didn't think that KSM was lying. Um, how, did you, how did you resolve that? Because he told you well, he was like we a movie director. We were, we resolved it the same way I think a psychologist would resolve a problem with somebody else. We said, help me understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, how is it that they think and that this guy thinks, because we don't think he's lying, mm -hmm. he thinks he works for you. How can that be true and what you're saying be true at the same time? And he said, I'm like a movie producer. I'm paraphrasing that. Yeah. He said, I'm like a movie producer. Bring me, they bring them all kinds of scripts. 
And some of those scripts are good scripts and he works them. Some of them he says, go off and try to develop it a little bit more and bring it back to me. And he said, so that's the same way with terror plots. People bring me all kinds of terror plots, hundreds of terror plots. Some of them I think, wow, that's a good idea. I'm going to use that. And I bring them under my wing and I fund them and, and I see that the terror plot goes through. Others, I think, like Hambali, I think, wow, oh, he doesn't need my help. All he needs is money. I'll mm -hmm. give him money. He goes off, he does it, right? And then there are others where you say, well, that seems like a good idea. I'm not sure about the practicality. Why don't you go off and try to do it yourself, try to develop it a little bit more? He said, so everyone who comes to KSM thinks KSM is working with him. Mm -hmm. And it turns out when you investigate this other thing a little bit closer, it was, you know, it fell into the categories that he was talking about. Sure. So, um, and he actually, he said he never said no to a plot because no. he would get credit if they pulled it off, right? Right. In his, and I'm not saying this is true of all who subscribe to the religion, right? I'm mm -hmm. not saying this is true for all Muslims. But KSM thinks that he gets partial credit when he's judged after his death for any terror plots that he's inspired. Even if he inspired somebody who's a lone wolf who never had any contact with him, if in that lone wolf's heart, at the time that he martyrs himself, he does it based on something that KSM inspired him to do, he gets a little vig from that. In the, you know, when he's judged in the grave. Uh, if he does a big plot himself, he gets a lot more big. If he does a little plot, he gets just a little big. And, and so his, his goal was to inspire as many terror attacks as he could so that when he was judged in the afterlife, you know, he would have a leg up. And, and, it, and the question that you've asked me is sort of spurred a memory that I have of, of uh, I asked him one time, why didn't you try to martyr yourself? You know, why didn't you stand there and fight it out with the Pakistanis? I mean, you had a loaded AK-57 right there by the bed. You didn't even pull it. You didn't even try to do it. And he goes, he goes, and we talked about Abu Zubayda, that Abu Zubayda had tried to escape and that he had been shot and, and uh, KSM hadn't done any of that stuff. And he said, well, he said, if I have only one life, if I give up my life, that's not as good to the glory of Allah, because I am much better at getting other people to give up their lives. And so he viewed himself as, because of this big thing, mm -hmm. he viewed himself as one of those, uh, those people who, who served his God best by getting other people to martyr themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have this terrorist think tank. We, we lost it when it comes to, uh, to Al-Qaeda core, what people now refer to as core Al-Qaeda. But it's one of the reasons why we were so successful at, at taking down a lot of core Al-Qaeda. Now we face this new danger from ISIS, uh, which is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. Um, and, and we don't have, I mean, we're not capturing or, or detaining anybody. I mean, how, how hampered are we in the fight against ISIS because we don't have this capability? Well, you can't know why something happens by looking at a photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll give you a real example. Um, when Nashiri was captured, he had a phone He's book. the coal bomber, right? Right, the coal bomber. He had a phone book on him. Mm -hmm. And in the phone book, he had names and amounts of money, right? I could have that phone book, and I could look at that, and I could see the name and the amount of money, but I wouldn't know what was going on in his mind, that what he had paid them for. I wouldn't know who those people were, what plots they were working on. You have to question the person. There has to be some sort of human intelligence involved, involved in the thing in order to know the motives. Uh, in a military situation, you may see tanks amassed on the border, but you don't know whether that's a threat, whether they're trying to be deceptive and think you're gonna attack from this way, but you're really coming in the other way. You have to talk to a human being to get that information, to know what's in their mind, and to know what's behind, what their intentions are with what you're seeing on the surface, because it doesn't always reflect um, what the person plans to do. So the, the problem we have is, is that there are different forms of human intelligence. There's signals intelligence where we can listen in on their conversations, we can intercept their communications. Uh, we, we could have assets that, are, that, are, that are, we deploy who send us information. But the only interactive uh, form of human intelligence is interrogation. So, like the only well, you've got debriefing. Yeah, or, or but I mean, I, I mean, having a t uh, questioning uh, people that you really inter. Unlike armies, navies, and air forces, where you can see them from the sky, when it's nineteen guys with box cutters, the only way you get the terrorist to stop a terrorist attack is get the terrorist to tell you 
what well, they're planning. Voluntarily, are. as you yeah. know, if you got somebody in the thing, or yeah. if you capture somebody, get them to tell you. Yeah. So we really need to start capturing people again. I think this is just Jim speaking. I don't speak yeah. for anybody but me. Mm -hmm. I think we need some sort of an, an intelligence-oriented uh, uh, detention and interrogation program. Because uh, right now we're droning them all. I mean, it, dead terrorists can't tell you their plans. Is, is the, have we gone too far with drones? I don't think we've gone too far with drones. I'm 100% behind droning as many of them as you can. I'm bothered by the fact that we, we kill granny and the, ba and the grandbabes as well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there's a lot of collateral damage. But wouldn't it be better to get them alive yeah, than to drone them? Yeah, it would be them? better. And it would be, I think, in the long run, more moral. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we have, a, we have a difficulty with grabbing. Right now it's illegal to take Khalid Sheikh Mohammed by the collar and just hold him by the collar, right? We don't have a problem with dropping a Hellfire missile on a family picnic or something, you know, but that's illegal. Yeah. So Donald Trump has initially said, uh, we're going to do waterboarding or worse. And then he had a meeting with General Mathis and General Mattis said, well, that never really worked for me. And uh, I, I think we can get more with, uh, with beer and cigarettes. Um, are, are either of those necessary? Do we need waterboarding or worse? And can we get information uh, with beer and cigarettes? Well, I'll make, uh, there are three points I need to make about this. Okay. The first thing I would, I, you know, from everything, uh, first I think it's probably the case that what uh, he said has been taken out of context. Okay. You know, how we, somebody says something that sounds like a, uh, a sound bite, and the next thing you know, it's everywhere. But let's assume that he means what he says, mm -hmm. right? I mean, means what has been reported that he said. What I would say to that is he needs to ask himself, respectively, you know, he's a hell of a warrior, he's uh, a scholar, uh, he's a brilliant man, he's much smarter than I am with a lot more life experience. I'm not trying to second guess the guy. What he needs to ask himself, though, is what would he do as a senior leader if he was captured? Would he be willing to turn over information that could get Americans killed or captured in exchange for a Budweiser and a pack of camels? I don't think so. It's insulting to suggest that he would. KSM didn't do it. For several days prior to being moved to a black site to be interrogated, CIA officers met with him for tea and respectful conversation, during which time he rocked and chanted and, and uh, essentially was treated them with disdain and told me later that he thought they were clowns, you know. So it didn't work for KSM, and I don't, uh, I don't think it will work for other senior terror leaders who are trying desperately to protect secrets. Uh, and don't really care about being in prison. Um, so uh, KSM said something interesting to you. He said that the American people would turn on you. Right. This is about 2000, and I think maybe 2004. 2003 is too early. It might be as late as 2005. But he was uh, uh, talking about how weak America was and that uh, uh, he, he didn't, they didn't have to defeat us militarily. They just had to win the battle in our minds, mm -hmm. right? And then he said, I understand why you do what you did. I would do the same thing. But your people will turn on you. America will turn on you. Your, your uh, uh, leaders will turn on you. Your, the people will turn on you. The press will turn on you. They will portray the things you did as outrageous and unnecessary. They will portray the war against uh, Islam as unwinnable and too cruel and um, that's essentially except for the people uh, you know I don't I haven't I haven't encountered in my personal life people uh, being angry at me but I certainly have encountered the leadership of the country um, pursuing us. Talk a little bit about what it's been like for you uh, since your name has come out so I mean you were investigated by the, by the Justice Department cleared by the Obama Justice Department. Well uh, the Obama and, Justice Department tasked Durham with specifically, this is the special prosecutor. The pros yeah, one of the best special prosecutors in the FBI, with specifically investigating whether or not people were tortured in that program. Hey, they had a grand jury, and you and I both know that a good prosecutor can get a cow indicted in front of a grand jury because there's no opposition. He presents the case the way it was. He had access to all of the papers that Feinstein's uh, staffers had access to. Uh, access to and maybe a, a, few, a little bit more because he actually got a chance to interview some CIA people mm -hmm. whereas Feinstein interviewed none of them 
right? And they investigated it for, I think it was a three years in front of the grand jury, and he returned. Uh, he said that, you know, that there wasn't any crimes to prosecute. And in fact, later on, uh, after the release of Feinstein's report, somebody asked the attorney general uh, if uh, any crimes had been committed by the, the CIA interrogators and, and the leadership of the CIA. And he said, I can't say that any crimes were committed. So in my mind, the issue of whether or not we tortured people has been resolved. And it's resolved in kind of a common sense way too. You know, if what we had done was illegal, they wouldn't have had to pass a law in 2015 outlawing it, you know? It, it w I mean, common sense would tell you if it's illegal, it's legal. You don't need another law. That's why we don't need to pass necessarily new immigration laws. We just simply need to enforce the ones that are on the books, you know? Um, you didn't just waterboard terrorists, you waterboarded lawyers. I did, you know, <laughs> uh, the Justice Department uh, was asked to opine, I think four or five times, uh, about whether or not the EITs were legal. And the last time that the CIA was considering waterboarding a person, I think this was 2004, maybe 2005, I don't remember the exact date, um, an assistant attorney general wanted to be waterboarded so he, could, he, he you know, before he decided it was or it wasn't torture. and. So then I waterboarded two lawyers. I mean, I waterboarded almost as many lawyers as I did uh, terrorists, and, you know, just one shy. And we waterboarded the assistant attorney general. He said it sucked. He said, he, you know, he, uh, uh, but then he opined a few days later that it wasn't torture, uh, that it didn't violate, well, he opined that it didn't violate U.S. law, that it didn't violate our treaty obligations, and that it didn't violate the Constitution. Right. What I would say is, to those people in government who persist in arguing that, you know, that this was something illegal, a great time for the highest law enforcement agency in the land to tell me that what I was doing shouldn't be done was when that guy got off the waterboard. As he was getting the water out of his hair and drying himself off, that would have been a good time for him to turn to me and say, stop that shit, yeah. you know? But he didn't. Instead, he opined that they could go forward. And you underwent waterboarding yourself. I did, it sucked. It absolutely sucked. I wouldn't want to do it did again. Did you do that on purpose before this program? To, to, was it part of military training or did you do it before, as a part oh, no, of this we program? Did it, to... We did it in July of, uh, of uh, 2002 to be sure that we had worked out all of the details about how we were going to waterboard uh, Abu Zubaydah. Mm -hmm. We waterboarded ourselves first to be sure that we had the safety measures in place, that we had the procedures in place, and so that we would know what he was likely to experience it. That make you more, not hesitant to use it, but more judicious in its application having gone through it? Because I well, know you, you would, pushed back, you pushed back when they, there was a point with Abu Zubaydah where they wanted to keep waterboarding him and you were pushing back saying we don't need to do it, he's cooperating. Uh, it was part of that having been through the experience part of it, part, inform you on that? Well, yeah, well, I knew it sucked. I knew what he was experiencing. Um, and when he started to look for ways to cooperate, I didn't think it was necessary to do that anymore. And tens of thousands of American servicemen uh, have been waterboarded. Is it uh, legal to torture our, tr our own troops? <laughs> no, I, I, you know, uh, it wouldn't be legal to torture our troops. Uh, uh, recently, in the uh, defense, fun uh, defense funding bill, um, you're restricted to just using the Army field manual. Well, if, if EITs, including the, gra you know, the, I mean, is it illegal now to, grab somebody by the collar, apparently it is, right? If, if the point uh, was that these things were illegal, you wouldn't have to pass a law making them illegal. Common sense would tell you, you don't need a new law, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and in addition, uh, John Durham, a federal prosecutor, was tasked by Eric Holder, again, the attorney general at the highest law enforcement agency in the land, to investigate whether or not any detainees were tortured in the legal sense um, during the CIA's interrogation program. And after years of testimony in front of a grand jury, he concluded that there was no case to be made. And when Feinstein's one-sided report came out, he was, Eric Holder, the attorney general, was asked directly whether or not crimes had been committed. And he said, I can't say that they have. And uh, you know it's interesting that uh, now we've gone from the extreme, from waterboarding on one end to the Army Field Manual. The Army Field Manual prohibits 
uh, techniques that law enforcement officials use every day. For example, threatening. You can a law enforcement or official or a district attorney uh, can go to a detainee and say, if you cooperate, uh, we'll take the death penalty off the table. So basically you're telling them, if you don't cooperate, we're going to kill you. You couldn't say that to a detainee today. No, you couldn't. In fact, let me make a point that I haven't made anywhere else. You know, um, when General Mattis said uh, he could get more out of a detainee with a beer and cigarettes, mm -hmm. the beer would violate the torture conventions because you're not allowed <laughs> under the torture conventions to give a mind-altering substance to someone that you're going to question. He could give him the beer, right? Uh -huh. But he'd have to wait till he was sober to question him because giving him the beer would not be legal. Well, the one thing we know is that the American people never turned on you, that the institutions of government may have turned on you or given you a hard time. But it's, it's fascinating how in 2009, when, the, uh, when the, this debate first broke out after, after the Bush administration left office, poll uh, showed that 71% of Americans supported what you did. And uh, in 2015, so after Feinstein and everybody else had made their case to the American people, uh, the number rose to 79% of Americans who supported what you did. Only 20% of Americans say that these techniques should never be used. So for what it's worth, uh, the American people never, uh, KSM was wrong. The American people never abandoned you. Oh, I believe that's true. I mean, that has been my experience in my, you know, in my neighborhood, in my town. But don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating that we torture people. I think everything needs to be legal. But you have to put it in the context of when it occurred. You know, 9-11 had just happened. We had uh, credible intelligence that they were planning another catastrophic attack, potentially involving nuclear weapons, because they had some intelligence that suggested that UBL had met with the Pakistanis that were um, passing out uh, nuclear technology to these rogue states that export terrorism, and that uh, UBL was asking them about, you know, building a bomb, and the Pakistanis said, well, the hardest part is getting the fissionable material, and UBL said, what if I already have it? And uh, we also had those anthrax attacks that were mm -hmm. taking place. Sure. Uh, and there was lots and lots of chatter about, you know, these other major attacks. And so we were told by the government to walk right up to the line of what was legal to protect the, you know, to protect the American people, and, and that's what the CIA did. Well, Jim, I was in the Pentagon when it was hit on September 11, 2001. My, my first son, uh, my wife was eight months pregnant that day, so my son was born uh, one month after 9-11. I have four kids now. Uh, I saw that evil up close, and I, like a lot of Americans, I'm grateful to you and to all of your colleagues at the CIA for what you did to make sure that never happened again in our country. Yeah, because I'm just the guy who wrote the book, right? There are lots of people who sacrificed a lot, lots of men and women, brilliant men and women in the CIA. Dr. Jessen's one of those people too, uh, who sacrificed a lot to keep Americans safe. Well, thank you for your sacrifice and thank you for joining us today. All right. Thank you much. All right.